Hi there. I'm so happy to be here. This is such an exciting time in history, and Hong Kong is such an exciting place for developing things like robots of many varieties, including uh, sailing robots, including artificial intelligence algorithms for, for video games. My specialty is um, robots that look very, very human. And um, the talk that I'm going to give you today is about using robots that look very human <clears throat> and start to behave in ways that are more human, more fundamentally human, to teach. To teach kids for medical education, for um, interacting with people uh, in a special needs situation who might need to practice social skills because they're in the autism spectrum. More than this, we're also looking at robots as a vehicle for new kinds of intelligence to come into existence. We want to teach the robots. We want to teach them our values. We want them to gain human cognitive skills and creativity. So my background is uh, fairly diverse. It includes arts, science, engineering, and bringing all these things together in robots that appeal to our sense of humanity. And uh, here's an example of um, some of my robots in action. They make a, a full range of facial expressions. Something's gone wrong. Let's back up there. Let's try that one more time, please. So you can see um, some of my robots look very human. Make very natural looking saccades. And I have some uh, software that can power these robots for seeing faces. This is a collaboration with uh, Keist. They made the walking body and uh, my team and I made the expressive face. This is another expressive face walking robot. We built that robot body at my lab in Texas. Now these robots, we combine with some software that can allow them to interact with you for real uses like teaching. So, thank you. So I'm going to describe to you some of the ways that I've used uh, these human-like robots in experimental educational applications. And I'm also going to um, describe to you how we're making them able to learn, my robots and others' robots, and also my own learning experiences along the way. It's kind of a, a path of creative discovery. It's, it's more than just uh, the road less traveled. It's more like the, um, the briar patch less crawled through. <laughs> All right, so educational robots have appeared in uh, science fiction for, for ages, right? So this is a cartoon from 1965, and there's a, a pervasive question for people who love robots and are interested. Where is my robot? Where is it, right? Where are these great things from science fiction, flying cars, etc.? They are here, educational robots exist in all kinds of forms, so in fact, you know, if you look at the one on the on the upper left, that's that's actually a robot from the um, almost the era when that cartoon was drawn. Um, an educational robot um, that's called the Hero. The rest of these are uh, have popped into existence just in the last few years. Vex robots, Mindstorms, uh, all kinds of humanoid robots. Um, that are used in education for teaching science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and maybe arts and design. So you can take this, this uh, acronym STEM and turn it into STEAM with art right in the middle. Right? So, so these robots are being used in education. And, um, and yet you can walk into most classrooms and you won't see, the, see a robot in the, in the classroom. The other question here, um, uh, like 
in addition to how can robots get into our lives, there's a question of why make them humanoids in the first place? And this is a question that uh, robotics engineers often ask. Um, however, if you want them to appeal to our natural social sensibilities, we are evolved to respond to the human-like form. So this is a picture of uh, my son with his grandmother. And when you look at that, you immediately know what's going on, right? You know the social exchange. You can feel that relationship between them. If we can do that with machines, that is incredibly powerful. That makes a, a personal, emotional connection with an educational experience. So if we can make robots that are beautiful and socially sophisticated, understand and care about us, then just imagine uh, all of the various educational applications that may uh, emerge from this. Now, that said, these robots are already used. Humanoid robots are already used in the world. They're used in medicine for medical education, for human patient simulation. They're used in entertainment. And they're used in toys. So they are, are fairly um, sophisticated robots at this point, but they're not human level smart. And they're not particularly expressive. So humanoid robots today are mostly simple kits used in classrooms, these kinds of simple human patient simulators. But as the technology gets more sophisticated, and I'll show you some examples of where it's going, these robots can become much more powerful in these kinds of educational scenarios. They can also serve as a telepresence device, a kind of robotic teleportation. So somebody, an educator, could be in a remote city and interact, or perhaps act through a human patient simulator. Um, and the AI, as it gets more sophisticated, it may not be human-like or human-level smart yet, but they become more powerful algorithms for controlling human-like robots. More meaningful experiences can come out. Now, eventually, may, we may actually achieve human-level intelligence in these robots, human-level creativity, learning, and discovery. So there are examples of a lot of uh, robots that have been in research for many years. And they're getting smarter, more physically capable, and considerably more popular. And you can see here some examples of increasing capabilities. Physical capabilities like uh, the ability to run, to interact with the physical world to some extent without falling over. And uh, these other two videos, if, um, if you'll click on the other two videos, then we can see some of those at the same time. So let's see if we can get, oh, wrong direction. So, um, you'll see that the physical bodies on these things are becoming more human-like. And if you look at the Atlas robot, which there's one at Hong Kong University, being used for the DARPA Robotics Challenge, these are human-level tasks in an unstructured environment. The performance on these robots, the capability of, of moving around the world is, is moving forward tremendously. Part of that is mechanical engineering, but um, a substantial portion of it is algorithms design, the ability to perceive the world, to model it, and then interact with it physically. Do you think robots will take over the world? Jeez, dude. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> But you're my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator, and I'll still be nice to you. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people's zoo, where I can watch you for old time's sake. I'm comforted. I'm very comforted now. I'm going to be part of his people's zoo. <laughs> so th 
that is uh, an example of um, uh, one of my robots, um, the Android portrait of Philip K. Dick, which has some AI software, and it simulates human-like intelligence. So it learns a little bit, it adaptively creates uh, new sentences and puts them out into the conversation based on what you've said before. Um, in addition, if you'll click on this one, let's see if we get this one to play. Um, I've created this, uh, this Hubo robot uh, that you saw in an earlier video, so I'm just gonna kinda scoop forward here. It's currently being used, or has been used, um, as a research platform for graduate students, um, who many of whom achieved their PhDs or master's degrees working on these um, robot platforms. Um, a lot of labs who do humanoid robots like this use this for inspirational outreach, and it um, increases matriculation in universities and so forth. So, um, so it's useful in that regard as well. Now, here is kind of an interesting um, uh, example where we... Uh, collaborated with the University of Memphis, Memphis Auto Tutor Group, where, and they had a, a physics tutoring um, software. So it uses natural language and can conversationally interact with you. Uh, video, please. So this is with uh, Andrew Olney. An airplane flying horizontally drops a packet on a pre-selected spot when it is right above the target. Does the packet hit the target? Explain. The packet will hit the target because uh, it'll fall straight down. Good job. <laughs> okay, what else can you say? When gravity acts on the, uh, the packet, it'll cause it to fall uh, straight down. Good. Think about this. What can you say about the packet's velocity at the point of release? The horizontal velocity of the packet is the same as the plane um, before it's released and after it's released. Good. Try this. The so, velocities of the objects before and just after the packets really saw the same. <laughs> so, Wait, so, so you get the idea here. There. So, um, what Let's was really fun is, in addition to, to doing this kind of um, Note, whimsical Billy the Big Mouth the packet, um, physics of the professor, time of release. <laughs> you also uh, we Let's combined the auto tutor together. software with um, the Einstein robot. So there you had a, a portrait of Einstein with AI that was capable of seeing faces and then teaching physics. So this software can work. It can work with kids. Now this is experimental software. It's not really commercially deployed, but there is tutorial software that is on the threshold of being deployed. Siri, but plus plus, okay? So um, we also are um, working with the University of San Diego, at Cal uh, um, University of California, San Diego, their machine perception lab. We built a, a big baby robot. And they are combining this robot with software that is like a developmental software emulating a human baby um, uh, psychology as it develops through various stages. And they have software that can see your face and recognize your facial expressions and see the environment a little bit. And it has a, a big um, body that looks like a, a baby's body. So it can kind of crawl and feel around. And we'll show, I'll show you some of the facial expressions. So here with uh, this uh, kind of expressive face hardware. Not only can it see your facial expressions, but it can display its internal cognitive emotional state um, on, uh, on this face hardware. Let's see if, if the, there we go. So you can see um, through the years how our faces get kind of more natural looking in their expressive motions. So now um, I've moved uh, my efforts here to Hong Kong, and we have uh, begun um, moving past some of these early like autism therapy and training experiments and some of these earlier um, robots that we've developed also used in education. Now we're making our hardware, our software, our art here based out of Hong Kong, collaborating with 
um, with several groups. And um, part of the critical aspect of our facial expressions is this material called Frubber, bio-inspired um, material. And uh, combining it with the arts, this is some of my art background, some of my sculptures that you might be interested in. So, very lifelike expressions combined with AI and seeking an understanding of creative imagination in the machines, right? Keys to human-like creativity include software, like the software that we've developed, but it's not as smart as it needs to be. So we're, we're aspiring, and as is the Open Card Group, to make machines that match human-level intelligence and genius. And so we're working with simulation environments, hierarchical learning algorithms, um, and then combining these things to try to achieve genius machines. Now, if you look at the, at the history of computing, we should match and exceed human level um, intelligence in machines maybe by 2025, 2030, but it's hard to tell. Once these algorithms get really good, then, then it could uh, be sooner. But most of the, uh, the AI and robotics out there, much of it is used for military. Uh, research. That's where a lot of the funding comes from. But we want to make sure they, that they empathize with us. This kind of social interaction is, goes beyond uh, these kind of uh, short-term uses. But if we actually can teach machines to be creative, teach them human values, then we can form relationships with them. And I think that's essential. But what happens when they go past? What if they get smarter and more capable than us? We have to consider that. And that's where we want to make sure we teach them the deepest, most, most kind and compassionate values that we can. So it's, we, we may only have a few years um, to teach them these, uh, these fundamental principles of character. And in the meantime, we can use them as characters for uh, experimental learning applications. Thank you so much.